General George Patton was commander of the Third Army. Fulfilling the fifth speech in the interpretive reading manual, Rodney will be delivering an edited version of a speech that Patton delivered to his men. Patton was criticized for including soldier language in his speech. The point of his speech was to keep up the troops morale and to prepare many of them to go into battle for the first time. The speech is eight to 10 minutes. Speeches in the interpretive reading manual are designed to be read, not memorized. Man, all this stuff you hear about America wanting to stay out of the war, America not wanting to fight, it's bull. Americans love to fight. All real Americans love the clash and the sting of battle. Americans love a winner and will not tolerate a loser. And that's why America never has lost and never will lose a war. The very thought of losing is hateful to Americans. Battle is the most significant competition that a man can indulge in. It brings out all that's best and removes all that's base. You are not all going to die. Only 2% of you would be killed in a major battle. Now every man is scared in his first action. If he says he's not, he's a liar. But the real hero is the man who fights even though he is scared. Now some men will get over their fright in a minute in battle. For some it'll take an hour and for others it'll take days. But the real man never lets his fear of death overpower his honor, his sense of duty to country, and his innate manhood. Now all through your army career, you men have complained about what you call this senseless drilling. That's all for a purpose. To ensure instant obedience to orders and to cre create constant alertness. This must be bred into every soldier. I don't want a man who's not always on his toes. But the drilling has made veterans of all of you. And you are ready. A man has to be alert at all times if he expects to keep on breathing. There are 400 neatly marked graves in Sicily because one man fell asleep on the job. But there are German graves because we found the poor sucker asleep before his officer did. Now, an army is a team. It lives, eats, sleeps, and fights as a team. This individual hero stuff is bull. The bilious idiots who write about that in the Saturday Evening Post don't know anything more about a real battle than they do about farting. And we have the best team. We have the finest food and equipment the best spirit, and the best man in the world. Why, I actually pity those poor suckers that we are going to go up against. All the real heroes are not storybook combat fighters. Every single man in the army plays a vital role. So don't let up. Don't ever think that your job is unimportant. What if every truck driver decided that he didn't like the wine of the shells and he turned yellow and jumped headfirst into a ditch? That coward, he could say to himself, well, they're not going to miss me, one man in thousands. What if every man said that? Where would we be then? No, I thank God Americans don't say that. 
Every man does his job. Every man is important. The ordnance men are needed to supply the guns. The quartermaster is needed to bring up food and clothing because where we're going, there's not a lot to steal. Every last man in the mess hall, even the one who boils the water so we don't get the GI runs, is important. Every man must think not only of himself, but think of the buddy fighting right along beside him. We don't want yellow cowards in this army. They should be killed off like flies. If not, they will go home after the war, stinking cowards, and they will bring more stinking cowards. Now the brave men will bring more brave men, kill off the stinking cowards, and we will have a nation of brave men. Now one of the bravest men I ever met in our Africa campaign was on a telegraph pole in the midst of furious fire while we were moving towards Tunis. I stopped and asked him what he was doing up there, and he said, I'm fixing this wire, sir. Isn't it a little unhealthy up there right now? Yes, sir, but this wire's got to be fixed. I asked, don't those planes that are strafing the road make you nervous? He answered, no, sir, but you sure as hell do. <laughs> now that was a real soldier, a real man, a man who devoted all he had to his duty, no matter how great the odds, no matter how seemingly insignificant his duty appeared at the time. And you should have seen the trucks on the road to Gavis. Those drivers were magnificent. All day and all night they crawled along those crazy, stinking roads, never stopping, never deviating from their course, with shells bursting around them. Many of those men drove for 40 consecutive hours. We got through on good old American guts. Those were not combat men, but they were soldiers with a job to do. They were part of a team. Without them, the fight would have been lost. Sure, we all want to go home. We all want this war to be over with. But you can't win a war lying down. The quickest way to get it over with is to get those who started it. The quicker they are whipped, the quicker we can go home. The shortest way home is through Berlin and Tokyo. So keep moving, and when we get to Berlin, I am personally going to shoot that paper-hanging son of a dog, Hitler. <laughs> now, when a man is lying in a foxhole, in a shell hole, if he just stays there all day, some German Bosch is going to get him eventually. My men don't dig foxholes. Foxholes slow our initiative. Keep moving. We'll win this war but we'll win it only by fighting and showing the Germans that we've got more guts than they've got or they will ever have. We're not just gonna shoot them, we're gonna rip out their living guts and use them to grease the treads of our tanks. We're gonna murder those lousy Huns by the bushel basket full. Now, some of you men are wondering whether or not you will chicken out and fight. Don't worry about it, I can assure you that you will do your duty. War is a bloody business. It's a killing business. The Nazis are the enemy. Wade into them. Spill their blood. Shoot them in the guts. Rip open their belly. When shells are hitting all around you, and you wipe the dirt from your face, and you realize that it's not dirt, it's the bloody guts of your best friend who was right beside you, you will know what to do. Now there will be some complaints that we are pushing our people too hard. I don't care about such complaints. I believe that an ounce of sweat is worth a pound of blood. The harder we push, the more Germans we kill. The more Germans we kill, the fewer of our men will be killed. Pushing harder means fewer casualties, and I want you to remember that. My men don't surrender. I don't want to hear of any soldier under my command being captured unless he is hit. And even if you are hit, you can still fight. I want men like that lieutenant in Libya, who, with a luger against his chest, 
swept aside the gun with one hand, took his helmet with the other, and bashed the crap in the head. Then he took the gun and killed another German. Now this, all this time, this man had a bullet in his lung. That was a soldier. That's a prodigious man for you. Now there's one thing you men will be able to say when this war is over and you get back home. 30 years from now, when you are sitting by your fireside with your grandson on your knee, and he asks, what did you do in the great World War II? You won't have to cough and say, well, your granddaddy shoveled manure in Louisiana. No, sir, you can look him straight in the eye and say, son, your granddaddy rode with the great Third Army and a crazy man named General George Patton. All right, you know how I feel. I'll be proud to lead you wonderful guys in battle anytime, anywhere. That is all. because you got right into it and didn't really tell us who he was until further down. But with the introduction, at least right off the bat, we knew who you were talking about. George Patton has always been one of my favorites. I love American history, any history. I'll just get into it. It's good. You were comfortable. You're always comfortable. You're always comfortable with the way you speak. I don't think it was necessary for you to be back here. I think you could have been here even though you were loud. I don't think you were that loud that you couldn't have stood here with us. It would have been better for us. I think you would have report with the audience a little more if you were actually here with us. But the loudness of his voice, that was just him. He was a loud person. But I, I thought he was great. You inspired us, you gave us an insight of the man and who he really was and how deeply he felt about the people he led. And that is a, definitely the strength of a good leader. He didn't care so much about his, himself as he cared about his soldiers. Those soldiers were basically his children. He really cared about them and that's the strength of a good leader. I don't think interpretive reading is the easiest thing in the world to do. It's one of the manuals I have avoided, <laughs> definitely avoided. Because I can't read and look at an audience and do everything, but you did so well with that. You came out all the time. The only thing I could think of was, you know, maybe occasionally you could have stopped slightly to let it sink in, to really make us feel his presence because he was a really strong person. Other than that, and stand with us. I think that's the only thing I can say about that. But that was great. It makes me want to see that movie again. I've seen it once. I'm going to go see it again. <laughs>